Well, welcome this morning. Uh, I'm Derek. I'm Dutch British, long story. Um, and uh, most people tend to know me because of PHP stuff. Um, I wrote some things for that. Um, I won't be talking about that what server, but there might be an example that uses PHP code in one of your slides. Uh, I like maps, I like beer, I like whiskey, and you'll see those items coming back in the examples that I'm using. It's a bit, well, besides the maps, the beer and the whiskey, it's a bit too early for that, if you ask me. All right, so what are we going to talk about this morning? I'm going to talk about non-scalar data. And first of all, I'd like to sort of define what I mean by this. Um, traditionally, what you would store in a database, you have like fields and you have values. And those values tend to be a single value, right? So there can be strings or numbers or booleans or whatever thing you come up with there. Um, but then you have non-scalar things, which are things like arrays and nested objects, arrays of objects, and so on and so on. I'm sure some of you have in the past stored a comma-separated list of values in the database field at some point, right? Just raise a hand, yep. And there's people not paying attention or lying. <laughs> Always the case. So yeah, this is the thing, right? Um, the non-scalar data aspect, you see actually show up quite a bit more. And in uh, uh, many relational databases, you, can't nest, you couldn't traditionally do anything with that. So a few examples here. If you have an article, you want to store some text with that, right? You, well, you, you want to say that this article is about Java and PHP and databases. Then, so initially, what you'd have to do in a relational database is you have to have this, this table that defines all your tags. Then you have to define the, the, the table that stores all your articles. And then you have this link table that links the, the, the articles to the tags, right? So you get three tables for doing that. But that's not particularly very efficient because you need to do like a two-table join any time you show an article. Now, other examples where this becomes sort of important if you have things like a set of properties that you need to store with, with something. Um, a traditional example here is using like a big product catalog. Right, so if you have a product catalog, most products will have a name in it, they will have a price in it. Right? So those are the fields that are the same for almost all, all things. That wasn't me. Nope. That wasn't me. I don't know. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, uh, so yes, uh, you have this set of properties that are always going to be the same for a product, and you have a set of properties that are going to be different. Like for books, you have an author and a number of pages, right? Whereas for whiskey, you'll have well, how strong it is and where it is from and, and how heavy it is for shipping and, and things and so on and so on. Right? So they have a very different set of properties. Uh, traditionally, in a relational database, how you would store those is you would store them all in very complex pattern called EAV, which stands for Ent Ent Entity Attribute Value Relationships. It, just, uh, it works well, but it is not very easy to find back things in the database when you look at it yourself. And it's kind of a complicated thing where you need to multi-table joins to get all your properties out of it. Unless, of course, you normalize it. But that's something in relation database you traditionally don't do right. So th those use cases here are the sort of data things we're going to have a look at, uh, but with, not with books. So what this presentation is not about, I'm not going to talk much about scalability or high availability or benchmarks, or I don't have the time to go in that, covering all the mentioned technologies here because I probably need a whole day for that. I only have 57 minutes left. All right, so the things we're going to look at is database types for non-scalar data. Uh, we're going to look at some query and manipulating data se uh, sections, and we have a bit of a recap at the end. To get started with that, first of all, let's have a look at different database types. Now, you're probably familiar with relational data type, uh, databases, uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, IBM, DB2, MSSQL, one of those, right? Probably should know them. Um, but there's, in the last, say, what, 15, 20 years, a whole bunch of other different types of databases that are also on the market. Often put under the gnome or NoSQL, which I don't think is a particularly good name for them, but it, it basically, Non-relational database is probably a better way of describing that. So um, there's three groups I want to look at. There's many model groups. If you look on Wikipedia, there's probably 80 different categories that people come up with. Uh, that's, I mean, overdoing it a little bit, I think. But to, to look at the most simple thing that you have here is usually a key value store. And a key value store is, is works really simple. They tend to be used for caches because they are so simple. Um, lookups. And storage is only done on the one specific key. And you can't do operations on anything else besides this key. A good example for this is Redis. Um, 
and in addition, I forgot to mention point three here, is that the values that you associate with those keys, they don't have to be just single values, right? They can be lists or hashes, but I'll go back into those in a moment. So the keys and values are binary safe strings. Uh, the values are safe strings, but the strings do a little bit more than just strings sometimes. Um, but besides a single, the scalar value of strings, they also can store hashes, lists, sets, sorted sets, and some others, of which I'll show you a few in a moment. And the interaction of it goes through a Redis CLI, or p Redis p Redis, which is a, it's a PHP extension to talk to Redis. Um, the Redis protocol is particularly quite simple. It is still a binary protocol, so you do need a little bit of logic to talk to it. Um, but the Redis CLI tool that comes with it is very simple, and I'll have an example of that in a moment. Uh, and the normal strings are sort of special as well, because you can treat them as numbers, and I will then use them as numbers instead of just pure strings. Um, so let's have a look at one of those of data types here. And as I said before, in key value storage, the only operations you can do on a key, right? So if you want to store, uh, say, properties of a specific product, in this case, the whiskey Glen Fiddich, and I want to do something with the property tags, what I actually construct myself is this key. Uh, convention dictates that you use the, the colon in between the different things in here. So we have the, the product category whiskey here, we have the name or the slug that we, that we have here is Glenfit 12, and then we have the property tags. So you build this key up yourself because as being a key value store, there's no other way of doing that really. There's no multi-column keys. And then with specific operators, you can add tags to this. So the first one we do as add, stands for set add. We add the tag fruity. And then the next one, we add vanilla to it, and, and then we add fruity once more. But because there's a set of data, and the set only contains the same values and not duplicate values, when I add fruity again, I won't do anything with it because it's already part of the set. Uh, and then if you want to do things with, like, uh, with spaces in there, you need to use double quotes, right? Then when you do a query, you can do m many different queries on sets. You can do test whether the set contains a member. So when we set, well, if the if there's a tag PT set on this whiskey, return one or zero, and of course, because we hadn't set it, we, we get a zero back out of it, right? So it means false, not part of it. And of course, you can query uh, all the members of the set. It is probably wise if you sit on that side of the room. Okay, I'm just warning you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, those are the sets. Now, an additional thing to this is hashes, and they work in a little bit of a similar, uh, of slightly different way, because in a hash, you have key value pairs that you store with, uh, with a property. So to go back to the example that I have about a product catalog, if I want to store multiple properties, what I'm doing here, I'm storing for the whiskey Ben Nevis 19. I store in the props field, um, I will store the key value combination distillery Ben Nevis. So it says basically the distillery for this whiskey is Ben Nevis. Um, you can also do HM set, which stands for hash multi set. And basically, I'm setting two properties here, right? The first key value pair is region, Scotland Highlands, and then the second one is H19, and that's how you sp uh, specify that on the command line. Of course, when you put things in a database, you can, can get things out of it again, so you get the hashes out of it again by using hash get all, which gives you all the key value pairs that are in there in a array, starting with one. I don't know particularly why they chose that, but that's how that works. And of course, you can get values for specific uh, uh, properties as well, and I have to mention here that although H, we stored like 19 as a number, right? It comes back as a string because the values are always going to be strings, with some exceptions. So that's what Redis does uh, as an example of a key value store, and there's other examples, of course, as well. So slightly more complex data, uh, data stores are the document data stores. They have often more richer data types. Uh, you, you can do, often do operations on both keys and values. In many cases, when you see documentation for these document stores, all the examples will show you the data objects in JSON. Um, that does not mean that those things are actually stored as JSON in the database, but it's often a way for communicating it or at least visualizing the data that goes in and out of it. And examples of this group are the ones that Lisa will be showing here, is MongoDB, CouchDB, and Elasticsearch. But of course, there are dozens more than, than these three here. All right, so let's have a quick look at MongoDB. It's an open source product, just like all of the others, really, so it doesn't really particularly need mentioning. Um, the documentation is often using JSON, but it stores the documents as something called BSON, which is binary JSON on disk. Um, 
The interaction with those documents is often through language-specific data structures. So if you are using Java, you build like the documents of like a, a Java builder kind of pattern. If you're using PHP, you can use PHP arrays and objects to store the data. And the driver will automatically convert us to, to this BSON layer under the hood. It's not something you have to take care of yourself. Um, the interaction, however, is a bit more complicated than with Redis because it is now a binary protocol, so you need an extension for languages uh, to interact with that. In PHP, it's called MongoDB, um, but there's drivers for, for any other language you can think of as well. So the interaction is a bit more tricky, um, but it makes it easier to, to deal with from your, from your language because it's a natural way of dealing with data in there. So documents are a bit more complex now because uh, we can have... Uh, well, we have key value combinations, right? So we have, um, in, at least in MongoDB, there's always this underscore default, which is your primary key. Uh, it's immutable, so you can't change that. And then you have the whole bunch of properties, and I just want to point out a few. Like the words one is an array of words. Uh, and that is the native data type in there. It's an array of words that you can do queries against even. And then batches is a bit more complicated as well, because it's an array of, of like objects again. So, not only can you store just an array of things, you can store an array of those nested documents. And this is basically the same about all the other uh, document data sources. They store something very similar, as you'll see in a moment. All right, so this is, I think, the only PHP example that I have, but it should illustrate enough how this sort of works. If you want to insert something, you create a uh, connection to a database and a table name, which in MongoDB we call collections. Um, we insert two documents. As you can see, they're just simple two PHP arrays that we insert. We treat them as key value pairs. And then with insert one, we insert one document. And with insert many, you do many. I mean, it's not particularly uh, very difficult. In all the languages, it works very similar ways. Um, having a look at CouchDB, it's also an open source Apache product. Uh, the documents are JSON objects. And that is also what you talk over the wire. So CouchDB exposes a REST API, which you can talk to with curl, or if you want to use an HTTP client, there's things like Guzzle and other things. So they, it's not a binary protocol, simple, very much a REST API, uh, which is handy because you don't have to divide specific language drivers, but then it's also not a binary protocol, so you end up having more data over the, over the wire. So it's a little different trade-off they have made. So to have a look at the document, as you can see, it is exactly the same document, with one exception, is that every document, so they have this unique ID, but they also have this underscore ref, stands for revision, which is important, we'll see later when we update documents. And this is something that is generated by the database for you. The number one at the start increases every time you update a document, and then you have a hash uh, describing uh, the contents of the documents. So that's couched to me. Uh, inserting in it is not very hard either. Uh, I forgot to mention with both MongoDB and CouchDB, you don't necessarily have to create a database. It'll just get created for you uh, without having to do anything, which is kind of handy. Um, so that's what I'm doing here, right? I'm posting in this de demo collection. I'm posting with a unique key, which is in this case Derek at localhost as my underscore ID value, basically, telling that it's a JSON, and then I give it a JSON uh, string containing information. And you can see here that there, the underscore default is not in here because you don't have to set that. And a return value that you get back includes this revision number, which is important to know. And I'll show you why later. All right, Elasticsearch, again, is a very different thing. It is not so much a database. It is more like a full-text search engine. But it is also sort of a database because you can store documents in them. Um, they use fancy words like near, real-time, text search engine. And basically, what it means is that as a database, if you store new documents in it, it takes some time for the index to parse this document and add them to the full text search index. That is often really fast, um, but it isn't instantaneously, whereas in other databases, when you store something, you have it immediately available through the indexes, right? So that's slightly different here. It is based on Lucene, just like Solar is, and Lucene is, well, I think originally a Java-based storage engine uh, um, that knows how to store full text search information, basically. And as many other tools like Elasticsearch have been built on top of that. And probably one of the selling points of Elasticsearch is that it's very easy to cluster. Actually, it's so easy to cluster that you sometimes end up doing it without wanting to do it. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was speaking at a uh, user group in Amsterdam. And I was borrowing the afternoon uh, an office of, of somebody. And I was giving 
a slightly different talk, but it involves Elasticsearch and it's <laughs> connected my laptop to the network and it started replicating somebody else's data because they were also playing with Elasticsearch. I mean, it wasn't important data, but it started replicating it. Uh, luckily, they have now changed their default configuration, so that doesn't do that out of the box anymore. Sorry? Yeah, it's changed now, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you, you now need to configure your cluster key, I think they call that. So, yeah. That's not, not a problem anymore, but that time I thought it was quite funny. Um, but it, it still illustrates that it is very easy to cluster because you just start all the nodes up in a network with the same config configuration name and they'll just start replicating. So that's really handy. So they don't, as I said, because it's not a traditional database, they don't really call them databases and tables. They tend to call them indexes and types. And a type is basically a collection where there's lots of common fields, although you don't necessarily need to have the common fields because they are being no skull solutions. Again, you interact with this with uh, JSON objects. Uh, you can do it with the REST interface or with some helper extensions or libraries. In this case, that's Elastic slash Elasticsearch PHP, which is something that the people from Elasticsearch have written. And there's, it's there for all the languages as well. Uh, again, Elasticsearch documents. Do you see any differences? Nope, I don't either, so that's good. Uh, and you can insert this uh, in, yeah, again, with curl or a REST API back into uh, the database. Uh, the curl URL is a little bit more complicated, but uh, other than that, it's practically the same thing, right? There's not much difference here. Yeah. Um, right. So one thing that Elasticsearch doesn't really do is, up again, that isn't me. Uh, what it doesn't really do is update documents. Anytime you do updates, it basically uh, replaces the document and has to re-index the whole thing as well. All right, so we've spoken a bit about key value stores and we've spoken a bit about document data stores, but we also want to have a quick look at relational databases because I thought, well, those document stores with all those properties that could get kind of handy and we want to have this functionality in a relational database because lots of people already use them, right? It makes sort of sense to, to add some of the properties from the document stores and key value stores as part of, of in this case, what I'm showing you is MySQL and PostgreSQL. Of course, all the databases will have different things, but let me just talk about these two. So the first one to, uh, to want to have a look at has, is MySQL, which has support for a JSON type. I call this very basic because the interaction with it are very different from what PostgreSQL allows you to do. Um, uh, they're, yeah, they're also working on something called a MySQL document store, which I, in my opinion is not a great name because of the only thing it really allows you to do is, is it's like CRUD operation, like create, uh, remove, delete, and, and delete? No, <laughs> read, that's, the, that's what the R stands for. It's not both <laughs> remove and delete because that'd be a bit silly. Um, so it's, it's a very simple layer built on top of MySQL that allows you to interact like it as it was like a, a NoSQL-ish data store. I don't think it's been released yet, uh, but this field goes really quickly, so the slides might be out of date a little bit. But I don't think it's been in a, this has been in a release yet. So this JSON type, the interaction with this is through strings containing JSON, which is a little bit different than, than what this, the, the REST APIs for CouchDB and Elasticsearch does, because you still need to construct this as part of a SQL statement. Um, the storage, again, is better than just storing JSON data because that's kind of pointless to search and, and things do with, right? And the manipulation is with specific SQL operators. They are usually, uh, luckily part of the standards, so at least between MySQL and PostgreSQL, they're practically the same. And uh, one of the properties that I found on the website said that the field order in, these, in this JSON type for the fields isn't guaranteed, which is sort of the case with the other document stores as well, but they tend to not to do anything bad about them either. So in general, they should be all right. Just to have a quick look at how to store something like this in MySQL. So if you look at on the MySQL command line, you can do create table users and you have the JDoc field and we call this the JSON type. And then in there, you can insert this JSON document. Um, as you can see, I use a single quote around it, well, difficult to see, and then with all the fields in there. Um, so you're inserting this string as it was a JSON document which means you need to be careful about escaping it, right? Yeah. Because the SQL itself needs something to make sure you're not escaping. For, for example, if you had a, a quote in one of the fields here, you need to make sure you escape it because it's part of a string. Uh, 
Uh, PostgreSQL has a few different data types in there. They have something called HStore, uh, which is very similar to a key value kind of data type. They also have a JSON type, but I won't be talking about that because it, they basically don't want to recommend it anymore. Uh, the JSONB data type is much better anyway, uh, so there's no need to use the other one particularly, particularly anymore. And the query syntax is, uh, and the index support is quite a bit better than MySQL, so PostgreSQL. So uh, again, let's have a look at HStore first. So HStore is, a, again, a column type, um, which is uh, a list of key value pairs, and they are both as strings. So it doesn't support richer data types here than just scalar values uh, for the HStore field, I think. I think the value can be in HStore too. So you can hmm. use key and put an uh, HStore value in there again. That's probably true, but I did not and try that, yes. I did not try that. <laughs> okay. You can. I'll, I'll give that a shot later. I, I tried that already. Okay, good. Okay, I'll play with that. Um, let's pretend we have only the simple set of document, right? Uh, so yeah, the, what is important that I said is that even though you store numbers and booleans in it, there are still strings. So you can't do particular queries against that. And what they style this as is often a, a field that is often not queried, although you can index this, um, for properties that are not necessarily part of every document. So for example, as I showed with the product catalog, it could be those extra properties. Um, I do quite a lot of stuff with OpenStreetMap stuff, and OpenStreetMap uses Postgres for under the hood quite a lot for styling map data. So there's lots of descriptions of objects in there that create a style of the map, but you can't necessarily store all the tags that objects can have because it's an unbound set of tags, and the way how the rendering of those maps work is that for every tag that you put in their schema, in a rendering schema, you have a specific column, and of course you can't have an unbounded set of columns, right? So what they often do is they have this set of properties describing one document that are often there and necessary for styles, and then for all the stuff that's hardly ever used, they put it in an HDR. So you can still do something with it, but you lose performance. But it allows you to store all the things that you want in there. So that is sort of the use case for that. Um, the JSONB type is similar to MySQL's JSON type, but also quite a bit better, because unlike MySQL, you can actually index it. Um, and it supports better or richer data types than the HDR, because it supports all the JSON data types, really. Um, this, the, the column type is called JSONB. Um, and yeah, we have now this richer, well, you might remember this, this JSON document from before, right? Because it's practically the same that I've inserted in both uh, Elasticsearch and CouchDB and MongoDB, right? So it looks like this. Uh, so after inserting data, we need to sort of query data, because databases are sort of useful to get data back out of again. Um, and yeah, I already sort of showed you how to do it with Redis, right? You can, in sets, you can check for whether a, a a key value is part of the set. Uh, you can retrieve all the uh, members of a key. Um, the hashes, you have hget all to get all the, the information out of a key, or you can do hmget, which you get a set of keys out of the hash. And I didn't show you the lists, but there's also like lists that you can set ranges from that you want to retrieve and stuff. And there's all the data types too, but there's many more like this. So that's how you query there. Uh, or, of course, you can request the whole property by, by its key. So in CouchDB, queries are primarily done through the underscore ID field, um, which is the default. Now, it is possible to set up secondary indexes and secondary keys as well, but you do that to something called MapReduce, so you need to define those views up front. It's clever enough that it doesn't have to recalculate a view every time you insert a document because it stores the keys anytime you insert or update a document. Um, no, it doesn't do that? Mm -hmm. It does an incremental update of the index once you query it. Huh. So in, the insert is cheap. Right, the for the first query, query is slow. Huh. It updates incrementally the view. I did not know that. Well, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, if you do a lookup on that, you tend to do it on your primary key. Now, I, I have to say CouchDB is not the database in our best in here, but um, that should be all right. And MongoDB, allows for doing queries without having setting up secondary keys up front, so you can do those queries right away. And this is a, a simple query that you look at, uh, which is basically, well, we find out, won't find, won't, again, that wasn't me. Uh, find out all the check-ins where the, 
there we go. Region slug matches Scotland Isla, and a rating is larger or greater than M3, and we only want to store the whiskey a rating in age fields. So there's this equality match, there's this match with a query operator, and there's many more than just GTE, stands for greater than or equal. Uh, and there's a projection. Basically, what it says is the following SQL. That's what it says. Like, select risky rating and age from check-ins, where regions like equal Scot Scotland Isla, and the rating is larger or equal than to three. It's not liking me this morning. Yeah. The stream is okay. The stream <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't help the people here, does it? <laughs> All right. OK. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's also uh, another way of doing queries is something called an aggregation pipeline where you run different operations on a whole collection in a go. So in this case, what we're doing is well, we want to find all the documents where the region slugs start with Scotland. It's a regular expression operator. And then we do a group by by region. But so basically, this says, find me all the whiskies in the region Scotland and then group them by specific subregion. So something you get back out of this. Uh, okay, I said those things already. And then you get something back like this. So you have the ID fields, which is the name of the region, and then it has an array of the whiskeys that come back out of that. So it's a simple group by uh, that you do here. And then, of course, unlike a relational database, it actually just returns the array here instead of doing a single record per uh, single record per return, basically. All right, so Elasticsearch uh, has two different ways of doing queries. Uh, you can do it on its primary key, uh, or you can do this on a field value combinations. That's a simple way. So here we're searching in users uh, count 16. So that's the key value per count has to match 16. And you get a result back out of that. But where Elasticsearch really shines is, of course, its full text search capabilities. Right? So you can construct queries like the following. Uh, like it's a Boolean query and they have all the queries as well, like just geo queries and a whole bunch of others. And it says the documents that I find should match the Siddery equals pandering and a, and a match whiskey should be sherry. And in this case, they both need to match, but you can construct queries where there's an, an, an or query or a Boolean not query and it's so much richer than I can show you here, uh, which is really, really good for building full text search index. Like, having a search box saying, well, give me all the documents or all the products that match these keywords and stuff and so on. Um, it, yeah, that works really well for that. Um, querying JSON objects in MySQL, um, I found a bit complicated because there's new SQL operators that I didn't really know up front. So if we have this table where we store the name of a whiskey and the properties, uh, in this case, we store the properties age, cast strength, and ABV or colored, so the last one isn't shared among the documents. Um, we can construct queries, say, select name uh, and age from the whiskeys where cast strength equals true. And that's what you get out of it, right? So cast strength in this one is true. And what we want to get out of it is the name of the whiskey, which is there, and then the age um, as a value. I'm not sure why it showed only a single arrow here. I expected it to show two, really. In any case, what I want to point out is that the way how you match against subfields is by using the dollar dot, that is the root of your document. Then you have the field name. And if you had nested field names, you can use another dot and then another field name to match against these queries. Um, the difference between arrow and double arrow is that this escapes the unescapes the, the JSON value, whereas the single arrow does not. Uh, in this case, that doesn't show a difference because it's a scalar value, but otherwise you would have seen that. All right, so the age story, yeah, you can also query uh, a slightly small example here. So what you can do is get a value for a key. You can, again, use this error operator. So find me, uh, for every document in the table, find me whether the isAdmin field, uh, the value of the isAdmin field. And then you get that back. Uh, you can find all the a unique user count with larger than 10 by, again, using uh, finding from the age doc the underscore default, which is uh, there at localhost, where the count unique is larger than 10. So then you find the documents there. So you can do queries on these on this fields um, quite well. You can also check whether keys exist, which, of course, you sort of need now. And you can match against key value pairs as well. Um, so let's have a look at indexes. So Redis is primary, only looks at the key, the only keys you index. That isn't quite true. 
uh, because the data structures that you store for each keys, like sets and lists, they are also optimized in its in-memory based index. So that is sort of an additional index to it, but it isn't something that is exposed. So this data structures can provide you some with additional indexing. In CouchUB indexes, as I said, there's by default you have the primary key being indexed, and then you have the secondary keys that you can construct with MapReduce. MapReduce is a ba basically a way for every document that you have. It will uh, emit something, key value pairs, which you then can use to do queries against it. Uh, it's kind of tricky to explain, but um, it, it is sort of how that works. The output you get back from that is also sort of defined by the view, because you define the sort order in there as well. You construct a, a, a new document. Can be the original document? Yeah, it's. Or a modified document. Yes. So the, what I've done here is, um, so those, those secondary indexes you store in something, I believe it's called a design document, as part of the database, and then you can do queries against those views. So that's why the word design pops up when you use the query. So I've only showed you really the map function. Basically what I'm doing here for every risky documents that I have, I emit something on based on the region slug and then the slug of the document. And when I do a query against this then, um, against this design document uh, in docs, I do the view by region because that is what I named this design document at, and then you get a result out of it. Uh, so you get all the rows, so you have the key Scotland Islands, the, the full ID field because I emitted that, and then the value Aaron because that's the one that comes out of the document. And you do queries against that. Um, works quite well, but you need to think upfront very clearly how you're, on which bits of data you're going to do queries on, which is something you don't really need with a relational database, with the caveat, of course, that if you do a query on something that you have an index, it's going to be slow. And um, that is basically the, the case for everything that you have an index, right, in any database. Think of it as a Postgres uh, computational index. I'll get back to the MySQL version of those in a moment. So in my skull, um, you can't, oh, sorry, it's a different, different word starting with an M. In MongoDB, you can do indexes, as I said already there, on the, on, on the underscore default because that's unique primary key. So that's on there. Uh, you can set up, of course, uh, indexes on, on keys, um, as well as you can set indexes on nested fields. You can do that in CouchUB in the views as well, of course. Uh, in PostgreSQL, you can do this as well. Um, and what is kind of useful is that you, if you set an index on a key that has an array of values, you can actually do an equality match against words. So you can say, find me all the documents where word matches Caden hats, for example, and then it will still find uh, this document. So that's kind of handy. Elasticsearch indexes um, get very complicated if you want to. So because this is a very different database, the index that you configure are full text search indexes. And they are meant for querying natural language. So they have lots of index functionality for, for language analysis. So you can set up different ways of how uh, strings of text need to be separated. Often you do it by space, but that isn't necessarily the best way of splitting up a string into words, depending on what your subject matter is. You can set up a language, and language rules then define how words are being stamped. So if you want to, in English, you want to have the word uh, walks and walk match mac at the same time you confer, configure a stammer for English that allows you to then to match those words directly on top of each other. Uh, you can do stop words that are not part of your index, so words like the and uh and and the kind of pointers in the, in the index, right, because it's not something you're ever going to look up on, and they take up lots of space in the index because it's used so often. You can boost specific fields to make them more important, Etc. 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 I mean, there's there's lots of stuff in there. Um, the indexes, as I mentioned before, are asynchronously built, so it sometimes takes a little bit of time before you can find a document after you inserted them. In PostgreSQL, you have something called a Gin index. Uh, you can think about Gin as a solution later if you want to. I just like the image. Um, so there are two types of indexes for JSON B fields: like key value uh, indexes or value indexes. Actually, I don't think I have an example showing you how to create the second one, um, but it shouldn't matter much. Um, so again, we're inserting this whiskey in here. We have a key value match. 
after we create this index. And what a gin index, in very simple words, does, it looks at all the key and value pairs and store them in an index. So whenever you match against either of them, it can find back the documents out of this uh, in a quite a simple way. What it doesn't really allow you to do is create an index on specific subfields. Uh, you can only index the whole data type, which is different than what CouchDB and MongoDB and to a lesser extent Elasticsearch do. But in most cases, it, it's pretty good, right? Um, again, you see this ampersand, I don't know, I don't know the name of that operator, but you can match against key value pairs again in here. Um, you can also check whether, uh, just like in MongoDB where I showed you that the words have a, a value called Alban in there, right? So we have the words here where you have Glenn Alban 25. So the GIN index is a bit better than just collecting all the data like a full search index, but it does uh, this kind of things as well. Yeah, go ahead. From what I believe so, yes, that is the case, yeah. So I... You could probably build an index with a functional index where you choose yes. a JSON number cast into an integer and put that as a key into an index. Yes. So you could use... You can do that. But as I said, I can't talk about all the functionalities in your databases, um, but yeah. So the annoying thing is that MySQL doesn't do any sort of this whatsoever. The only way how you can index those JSON documents at the moment, as I said, this field moves quickly, is uh, only through generated columns, through virtual generated columns. So if you want to index on, say, the ABV, the alcohol by volume, what you have to do is alter my table whiskey, other column, ABV, float, generated always, being always there, as properties ABV. So that plucks out this ABV field out of the properties JSON fields, create a virtual column out of that, and then you can put an index on this virtual column to index that, uh, which is what I'm doing here, right? Since so we create this ABV index on whiskey, ABV, which is the value I plucked out of it, even though I hadn't stored that in the document itself. It's not, um, you, you can make this a materialized view, but I don't, I don't believe you have to, actually. Um, so, yeah, that is currently how my score does that. So the last thing I want to talk about quickly is manipulating data. And the important word there in any database that you have is atomicity. You want to make sure that no two programs or scripts or threads at the same time can update data. Uh, traditional relational databases have like this asset compliance kind of thing. Uh, that is not something that NoSQL solutions often do, but they have different ways of, of making sure that you don't update data incorrectly. So, Important word to remember is that you should never retrieve a document, update it in your client, and then store it back again, because that's a very dangerous thing to do. You get really loopy. Okay. So how Redis does this, it has like special operators that you can run. Uh, so if this is the start of my document at start, so that we have this properties again, where the age is 19, you can run h inc by, which increases the value of a specific property by the number that you specify. So what this says is increase the property H in this key by one. And here, Redis does something more than just strings because it knows how to add one to the string 19. And then you get it back as a string 20. One A. No, you do not get one A. <laughs> That'd be mean. <laughs> I don't think it does hexadecimal, actually. <laughs> So that, that is how Redis does it. it. It has specific operators to operate on this data. And basically doing a, a set at is a very similar thing that I showed you before, right? Um, you can also do queues, like using L push and L pop uh, that, that push things on the front of, a, of a array, pop them off at the start of an array. So you can implement a kind of queuing protocol with that as well, all using those atomic operation, operations. Yeah, yeah, one more. Uh, in CouchDB, it is, um, say we already had this document with the key Derek at localhost in there, and we would do, uh, we want to store this again, it tells you, no, can't do that because we already have a document with this key, which is kind of annoying, because how would I update this document, right? Because if I want to update, I need to store it with the key again. Um, so the way how you can do that is, this is where the underscore IV thing comes into play. What you need to specify for a update to work is the REV field that you have gotten back previously. 
And the cool thing about this is, is that if you do this at the same time from two different threads, only one is going to work. Uh, you also know which one is going to work because it will tell you either the new revision number or it tells you the, you get a conflict because the document that you want to store with the revision number you thought it was is no longer there because the first thread has completed and has stored a new revision number. So this is how this solves conflicts in storing this atomicity data. And then your application can decide what to do out of that. Right? It can decide to restore the document, potentially probably overwriting the original uh, save that has been made, or just something more complicated where it compares the documents and see which values have been updated and issue that as a new document. And the revision is used like from CouchDB for application? Yes, it's sure. It's yes. On the, on yes. The yep. Um, it, in a similar way, when MongoDB, this replication has its internal things that work sort of in the same way. So I should mention that, oh, this is my second PHP example. I'd forgotten I had two in there. Uh, it doesn't particularly matter. Basically, what I'm doing here with find one is I find a document in Derek R, then update the data locally. I set the steps made key, the, the key 2017-0202, and then I add 7124 to this number, and then I update it again with the document. This is not an atomic operation, right? Never, ever do something like this. So what you can do instead is you can use update operators. So what this example says is that we're going to find all the documents where person equals Derek R, which is hopefully unique. And then we're going to increment the value that we have stored in steps made dot uh, 20170202, which is the dot operator just like in the JSON uh, field types that I've showed you before is uh, an, in, an array deferencing operator and we're adding 7,124 to that. So this is one of the atomic operators that sort of like Red has had with the H in Kribai, right? It's a similar idea. Um, also, if you want to do sets, in MongoDB you can do the same thing. So you can do R to set, which is Red is set at or S at. To the field tags, we then add the value of the tag. And again, you don't get duplicates in it because it's a set. What you can also do is you can do push, which is very similar to R to set, but it doesn't care whether you have duplicate values. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding two tags, MongoDB and XDBook, for example, and then I have an extra argument to this, which is called slice minus two, which basically says only keep the last two in the array. So this sort of allows you to keep only the last 10 tags that I've stored and things like that um, as an atomic operator. And of course, most of the databases have very many more of those atomic operators. But again, I can't really talk about it because I don't have enough time. So then, the last thing I was, I was slightly want to touch on is that in a relation database, you're of course aware that you have to create your scheme up front, right? In most of the no-scale solutions, you don't really do that. You don't really do that by configuring it in the database. You do that by thinking about it really, really hard and then thinking about it once more um, to make sure that the application knows how to deal with the data, which is a very different thing than you do with relational data. Very traditionally, you st always start out by, how can I store my data in the most efficient way, right? You, you, you create a schema according that you have no data duplication and so on and so on. Now I realize that that doesn't always work very, doesn't always work as well as, it, as you expect it to do, so you do denormalization. Now no SQL solutions or document data stores, you don't tend to do that. What you tend to do is you create your schema, at least logically, depending on how your application interacts with your data. So that determines how you store your data. That, that often means that you end up storing some duplicate data, um, but that's all right. Uh, and you shouldn't be too afraid of that. And it's a, it's a common, well, I wouldn't call it practice, but it's not a bad thing anymore. It, uh, it's important that your application can interact with your data in the most efficient way not necessarily how efficient it is to store your data. And you end up making trade-offs here, right? Because some, some database schemas are going to be really good for retrieving data really fast, but it sometimes can be more cumbersome to update because you have this duplicated data and you'd have to update it in multiple locations. So this is something that you need to think of when designing a schema, how that works. Now, to look a little bit at schema validation is that most NoSQL solutions will not do anything for that. It tends to be pushed to the application, and that is um, 
Uh, also true for the relational databases where you have H to JSON, JSB. I'm sure that PostgreSQL has some functionality that you can enforce a little bit more on it, but it isn't going to be as rich as enforcing that on, on normal schemas in normal relational databases. And in NoSQL databases, it's generally also not possible to do. Uh, many people use ODM kind of patterns on top of that to deal with this data. Uh, I just want to show you MongoDB because it does have something like this. It's like it, you can actually configure per collection a way to enforce a schema. This is a very basic way of doing it. Uh, what you can control is that specific fields need to be of specific data types or fit in specific values. Okay. I didn't find that. Okay. 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 I couldn't find that, but uh, I, I believe you when you say that. Say that. Um, it's a very basic way of doing this. Still, I mean, you, you can't, for example, say that we only want these fields in here. You can't exclude fields from being stored in the database and stuff like, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, but hopefully that's coming in the next release of MongoDB 3.6, where you, uh, it will actually have full support for JSON schema, which is something I'm going to expect to see coming in PostgreSQL and on some of the other NoSQL solutions as well, because it's such a nicer way of defining a schema for sort of freeform data, which is, I think, a, a useful thing to have. All right, so to draw to the conclusions before we have some time for some questions is the way non-scalar data is stored in the other database is quite different, right? In Redis, it is stored in only sets or hashes. In the document data stores, it tends to be JSON documents. In re traditionally relational databases, you have fields where you store JSON documents, and you tend to interact with that as they were strings. All of those solutions are going to be valid, all depending on what you want to do with your data, right? So if you're already heavily invested in a relational database like MySQL and PostgreSQL, adding this JSON or JSONB or HSTOR type is a valid way of doing things. Um, if you want a full text search index, want to search on natural data, Elasticsearch is going to be the best thing, right? If you want a very fast caching key value store, a key value store like Redis is going to be your thing. If you have a um, need for storing more complicated documents, which is sort of how your application would interact with this data, like the products catalog that I showed you before, a, a document data store is going to be your, your best bet of picking. There's lots of different things that you need to think of by picking the right solution. And it is a very difficult thing to say which one is best for which use case, because it all depends on which data you're storing and how you interact with your data. So I can't really give you a, a real, if you do this, then you have to pick this kind of database, right? Because there's such a vast array of them um, that you really need to think about how, how you do this kind of stuff. Um, but things you need to think about is what sort of the format your data is in, how you interact with it, uh, how you want to find data back, and this is where the indexability comes back out of it, and how and when you want to do data manipulations, right? Um, as an example, Elasticsearch doesn't really do updates of documents. You can only replace a whole document, for example. Whereas uh, with both Redis and relational databases, you can tend to want to update specific fields. But if you want to update a JSON B type field, then because this is a single field, it is more difficult to update specific values of the subfields in there. Although you can do things like that with PostgreSQL. Uh, so yeah, it is a very complicated thing. And what, and what I hope you, to show you here is more um, what all the different things are out there and sort of the difference between them uh, more as a, as a hint for you to go look at them in more detail. Because as I said at the start of the presentation, if I want to talk about all of these things, I probably need about eight hours, uh, which I don't have. So with that said, are there any more questions? Go ahead. Are the differences in MySQL or MariaDB JSONB types? I don't believe they are. And if they are, they're going to be very minimal. Said that, I would definitely expect MariaDB to be further along adding more of these features than MySQL would be. Because, yeah, that's my feeling on this. But I have no specific evidence to that. Right. Anything? Yeah, go ahead. Just an addition for <laughs> choosing the right tool. Uh, yeah. We're using uh, Redis. CouchDB, Elastic, and Postgres. 
and um, choose your tool very wisely and think about backup restore. Yes. With all the no SQL stuff, it's it's like all those hipster tools that got that anyone would like to back up their data. So you need external tools, scripts, whatever, to get the data out of your database again. Which is a very natural thing for Postgres to do. You just do a PG dump and everything. Yeah, is but, there to but MongoDB has the same thing, right? It has Mongo dump. Yeah, but it comes with the database. Have yeah. Does Elasticsearch have a tool to dump it? No, you can snapshot yeah, but by re index. But MongoDB has that, for example. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Arguments don't really work well for the, um, for the streams. Um, clearly, you need to think about backups, but there are different tools do that in a different way. Um, I only know how MongoDB does this really well here because it's, I'm most familiar with that. There is a MongoDB dump tool. It comes with a database. Try that and look at it. Backup yeah. restore. But there are other ways of doing it as well, right? Because the, the no-scale solutions tend to be more distributed systems. What is also a common thing to see is that you have an extra node that is there just taking the backup. And having backups of a distributed set is often less necessary. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. You should always have a backup. But it's less necessary because you're going to have multiple copies of your data in the first place. But things like Redis, because this all runs in memory, there's not really a way of, of doing it as a deep, as, as a as a dump to disk. There's functionality for doing that, but it's not what it's made for, right? So you need to take those things into account as well. And that's all about what I want to say about that. Anything else? No? All right, well, in that case, I have one more slide uh, that says, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to upload the slides to this year all. I will probably do it in the next few days. I've not only can you find the slides on this year all, I also have a list of resources that points to some of the research things that I found while making the presentation. If you have any questions, also feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to answer questions or integrate comments if you have them in the presentation as well. So with that said, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.